All right, let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the last uh, round of presentation of uh, Config Manage Camp again 2019. Uh, my name is Edward. Uh, today I'm going to share with you some of the learnings that uh, we earned during the journey of building a containers-based platform for hosting web services in Thermomans at uh, Booking.com. Um, a bit about myself. Um, I like to hack on, th hack on things, be it digital or not. Uh, in my free time, I like to play tennis. I like cars. This is me in going on two or three wheels in a go-kart. Uh, that's not the fastest way around the corner, but it is fun. Um, as for work, I work at, uh, at Booking.com. I've been there for more than five years. And uh, during the, the first years, I was working in a team that was uh, managing the infrastructure for all the customer-facing uh, web server roles. And uh, for a team of five to six people, that's, that's a lot of roles. There were tens of roles, sometimes close to 100. And the worst part about it is that sometimes it took us two weeks to provision a new role for a colleague to be able to put out his idea in production. And that's, that was too long. Uh, in order to solve this, our uh, team started um, experimenting with containers-based platform. Uh, we started this in a, in a hackathon. Uh, we had two people working on it. And, and uh, the focus was on using off-the-shelf components that would work well together uh, and covering the, the, as many of the use cases as possible. Uh, in the end, we settled for a setup with uh, Mesos as a resource orchestrator and Marathon, Eremetic, and Kronos frameworks on top of it. Um, it was fine. We, uh, we had some early adopters. They were aware of the explorational status of the platform. Uh, however, it became obvious that we would need more enterprise features. Booking is a big company, so this does make sense to have those kind of features. Um, we went, we spoke to the management, we got buy-in, we got more resources, more and more seniors. We uh, looked at uh, you know, what, they, uh, what they wanted for us. They wanted to be production ready, and they had a long list of features. So we uh, investigated what, um, what were the options available to us, and in the end decided to go with, uh, with OpenShift. Uh, because it ticked most of the enterprise uh, enterprise features. We made an MVP. It was announced during an all hands with hype and promises. We did a, a live demo, which worked, you know, defining a new product, a new service, putting it in, uh, deploying it, and putting it in production, so really nice. Uh, however, problems started some, some months later because um, users were complaining that uh, they were encountering uh, problems that they didn't know how to, how to troubleshoot. Um, and it all culminated when um, we tried to upgrade the OpenShift, uh, emergent version upgrade, and it broke horribly wrong. The reason for that was that by, time, by this time, we had already accumulated a decent amount of customizations, which is you know, how, how things work. You, you take something open source and you decide, okay, this needs, I need to create a controller, I need to make these features available, and um, that's, that's what, uh, what what was broken for us. So we looked at the situation, and it was obvious that we could not go on the same path. This would not scale well for our team, um, but we also wanted, you know, we saw the, the benefit, we saw the promise of this technology. So we wanted to, do, to adjust only slightly the direction that, that we were going with this, um, with this tool. Uh, the biggest problem that we had was replicability. We wanted to get from this, from running on-off script, one-off one scripts, like, uh, like Lee mentioned, to, to this. We wanted to have a full setup that would install the cluster for us, that would be, would be able to do upgrades and, and so on. In order to do this, we focused on the control plane. In OpenShift, we were running the control plane in containers because you know, that's how you do it by default. And uh, that, that made it difficult for us to, to troubleshoot it because you know, maybe us in our team, we were aware that the Docker is not such a big scary wolf, but other people, when we had a firefighting, they would be reluctant to, to join in. So we decided to move the control plane directly into OS, into, into operating system, in, 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 and run it with daemons with, uh, with systemd, um, because that gave, the, um, gave back the, the certainty and the, the, ease, the peace of mind to everybody, to all the sysadmins, that they could troubleshoot when, when things were, were, were going bad. Um, another thing that we did was to, and well, this goes really well into, into the previous uh, presentation, we decided to take the, um, the, the config management and, decide, uh, and apply it in the same way that we were doing in the rest of the bookings infrastructure. Before, we were using the uh, playbooks, the RL community provided Ansible playbooks, uh, and 
they work to some extent, but as we saw, they broke terribly wrong for us. So the moment when we moved to put everything with, with Puppet, then we regained the control. It was a difficult, a difficult journey. Um, at, at times, the, um, the code of the, uh, of the Puppet recipe can, can be quite uh, cumbersome and ugly, but the worst, the, the worst thing that you can do is to create a, uh, a file with Puppet and then just kubectl apply it, and that thing works. Uh, another, another issue that we had moving from OpenShift to vanilla Kubernetes was that before, if you need to run a component uh, be, uh, behind a, a replica set, it's really easy. You just define it, you, you are sure that you have one uh, instance of that component running all the time. You don't need to worry about it. However, when you need to do this spread over three or five masters, and you need to run this with, uh, with systemd and deploy it with Puppet, it's not as easy. Um, in Kubernetes, you can, um, actually in, in anything, uh, you can add another distribution as well, you can add a sidecar to your application, and that sidecar can do the leader election process, and then you can take some decisions based on which part is the leader elected. Uh, we took that, uh, that component, that library actually, we wrote a, a small binary that does leader election inside the cluster, and then the, the instance that was the elected leader, then they can start the, the one component that cannot run in, in parallel. So we are using this uh, in our case for, uh, for Trident, which is uh, the storage provider. Um, this way we, we make sure that we have only one instance because they don't work, will work well in parallel, uh, and it is always running. Um, another um, topic that we, we tackled was, um, was the feature set. Uh, when we went from V1 with the experimentation status of Marathon to uh, OpenShift and we spoke to business, we, we came back with a huge list of, um, of features that uh, were, were deemed necessary. Uh, some of them, we realized they don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of customers and they were introducing a lot of, um, a lot of complexity in, into the infrastructure. Since our goal now was to uh, was, was focused on reliability. We wanted to get back the control of our, of our infrastructure. We challenged the need for those, uh, for those uh, features. Uh, one such feature was the project isolation, which we deemed necessary in the beginning, but then it wasn't really obvious that we need it. And the component that it brought to the table was the open vSwitch. Uh, this was one of the most difficult problems that we had in, in OpenShift. Uh, the issue that we had was that we noticed from time to time that the OVS rules from Open vSwitch table, they would just go missing. We were not able to uh, pinpoint it to an application because other parts of the same customer would be running fine to a node, it was happening all over the infrastructure, uh, and it also was not really replicable. It would happen on the same node, two parts of the same application, one of them running three, uh, three days, seven days, the other one running five days, and it would only happen for, for, for one of them. So it was a really difficult uh, problem. The moment we took this, um, this feature out, we were able to get rid of uh, open vSwitch on our nodes and we didn't have uh, the, the constant churn of, of, of rules anymore. This also made possible the second item that you see listed here, which is the directly addressable pods. This was a feature that was requested quite early when we were into OpenShift uh, because our users, and by the way, when I say our users, I mean our colleagues in, in Booking.com, which are the users of our platform. They were used to using the clients and the frameworks and all the code that we have around uh, that can do retry and smart logic and so on. And, but that, th those clients rely on, on, the, on having the control of where to send the traffic. Uh, when you're masquerading your, uh, your pods behind a service IP, you lose that control. So they were, they were constantly asking for directory as well pods, and this is uh, the moment when we made this possible for them. Um, okay, this is, how, uh, this is the details of how we, we implemented that. Um, we decided to take out um, proxy from, uh, from the nodes, so we don't see it running here, but we also assigned a, a static subnet to, to, each, uh, to each node, and we have a kubelet that calls this plugin, which picks an IP for a new pod that get, was just scheduled on that, uh, on that node, gives it back, and then it's configured on, um, on, on the pod. Uh, we're using BIRD to, BIRD is a, is a, is a routing uh, daemon. So it can establish a BGP session, in our case, with the top of the rack switch, but you, know, you can have just one router if you want that. Um, and it advertises to the rest of the infrastructure the subnet from which pods 
being scheduled on that node would, would get their IPs. Uh, when a pod is uh, a startup, uh, it gets a VTH pair, so the one end of the pair goes into namespace of the pod, and that becomes ETH zero of the pod. The other end of the VTH pair goes into a bridge with the ETH zero of the node. So this way, we do not need to do any routing, we do not need to do any IP tables, masquerading, and so on, on the nodes. When a packet arrives, because you know it's through BGP, everybody knows that it's supposed to arrive for this pod on this node, it's just being picked up by the, by the, by the pod. Um, however, besides doing the constant masquerading of, of pod uh, traffic, uh, QProxy also gives you the um, cluster IP and services functionality. We wanted, although we didn't have as much use for it anymore, uh, there were still applications where this was, uh, this was necessary, so we decided to still keep around the QProxy functionality. We created a new type of nodes, we call them gateways. Uh, we do not run any workloads there, we don't even run Docker there. Uh, but they do use the same uh, mechanism as we do with the regular nodes. We have BERT advertising the, the whole ser uh, IP range from which service IPs gets assigned. Again, we're using BGP to the rest of the infrastructure. And then here you have QProxy who constantly updates the, the IP table rules and, and masquerades the traffic that would come through a service IP and then sends it to a, to a pod. Um, this, of course, can become a, a single point of failure because if you only have one gateway, then we are using um, um, any cost, an equal cost multipath, uh, and we advertise the same slash 22, oh yeah, I should mention this as well, uh, the same slash to, uh, 22 from three or five or whatever, depends on what scale that you need, more than one uh, machines, so we can take out one machine and not affect uh, the entire traffic. Um, one thing that I want to mention, you see here on the left side, that the BGP advertises slash 27. Uh, this came from experience running Docker in OpenShift. We saw that when the number of running containers goes beyond 100 or 150, things would get really slow. Uh, another restriction in our case here is that now the pods are addressable, are routable. So you, we are using still IPv4, and you have, we have a limited number of uh, IPs that are available to us, so we cannot reuse them between clusters. So that also reduces the total number of IPs that we can assign. And there's also a limited number of additional routes that you can publish into the routing table. Uh, so in our case, we settle for a slash 27, which means you can run roughly 30 pods per node. Um, we didn't reach the conclusion, I mean, so far we've been running like in this setup for, for about a year, and we don't see the need to, uh, to change this. Uh, one thing that we did notice was that pods were getting more and more sidecars. So now we have applications that have f five or six uh, sidecars, con sidecar containers. Uh, so I don't think we will have, uh, we will ever need to run 60 or 100 pods per, per node. Um, okay, uh, going back to the, to the feature set, uh, another problem that we experienced uh, in, uh, in, in OpenShift, so in our uh, version two of the, of the platform, was that we were sharing resources between clusters. We wanted to allow users to, um, for example, to have persistent storage, remote persistent storage that was shared between clusters because then you can, for example, have an application, let's say it, it's, a, it's a WordPress, right, it's a blog, and people upload content to it and you want to put that in a location that is reachable from all the clusters, from all the instances of your application. Uh, this is nice to have, but it introduced, it actually, it, it, ex it made everything one big failure domain. And uh, we wanted to, to, to reduce that, so now we said, okay, all the components that are used by a cluster belong only to that cluster. This allowed us to, um, to, to limit the failure domains to, to regions or to data centers, that's how you want to call it. Uh, and then we went a step further. Okay, I have these, these two regions are totally separated, but I also want to be able to do maintenance on clusters without affecting the users in, in that region, so without losing the DR capability. So then we said we will have multiple clusters, in multiple regions. All of them are totally separated. Uh, this, this is a difficult, well, well, not a difficult decision, but it was um, maybe somewhat controversial. How many, what, it, what is the recommended uh, number of clusters that you should have in your infrastructure? We went and we spoke to other companies, other teams, we saw what other people were doing, and it ranges a lot. It ranges from big companies saying that you should put everything under one umbrella because then you can reuse the spare resources. But those companies generally also have uh, big teams that uh, manage not everything, but individual services of the cluster. And they're very specialized. They, they, uh, they are uh, confident in, in, in being able to 
not screw up, basically. And then it goes all the way to the other uh, end of the spectrum where companies that are not small, so for example, I remember now the case of Zalando, who has, I think, one cluster per product line, so they have tens of clusters, close to 100. Uh, we decided to stay somewhere in the middle with uh, you know, the, the right balance for us to, would be to have several clusters for every, uh, every region that we have. And the main thing that you should remember here is only to limit the failure domain. We didn't consider the, the needs of the product or, or, or we also didn't go um, in the other extreme with having one big cluster just to, to save on, on resources. Um, okay, uh, the next, uh, the third um, vector of, of, of change was that we wanted to improve uh, observability. One problem that we had in, in, op in the version two of the, of the platform was that we were finding out about issues from, uh, from, our, uh, from our users and we wanted to, to stop that. Uh, when you're thinking about uh, the reliability of your platform, the first thing that maybe comes to your mind are latency of the API server or error rate or so on. Those are good metrics to have, but they are not really important for the user. Me as a user, I care what, how long it takes from the moment I press enter on a command till it's actually reflected in the infrastructure. And uh, we, we, we went and we defined these, um, uh, these SLOs and tried to make them as, um, as relevant for the user experience as possible. Uh, one such uh, example, and actually the best one that we have so far, is the pod startup time without image pool. So you define, a, I want to run this pod in the infrastructure, how long it takes from when you send the command till you actually have the pod, uh, the pod running. Um, this is good, defining relevant LFO, uh, uh, SLOs for your customers, it's a good, very good practice, but at least in the early stages of the, of the infrastructure, we realize that we do not have enough customers to exercise those, uh, those SLOs. So, um, for example, if you, if you have, um, I'll go into this a bit later. So what we went, we went and we, uh, we created these pros. We call them Q pros that verify all the functionalities of the cluster. It goes from a simple ping test or connecting to an outside service, all the way to full integration with defining a new service, uh, waiting for objects inside the cluster to be created in order to be able to deploy that one, deploying the service, requesting dependencies, scaling up, uh, configuring external resources like DNS or load balancers and so on, verifying the full loop that you can actually use that service and then delete and clean everything up. Um, of course, some of the probes stay longer than, than other, but others, but you can adjust the schedule and that's not a problem. Uh, now that we have all these, um, all these probes that were exercising the SLOs, we were really confident about the state of the, of the, of the infrastructure. Uh, we went and we said, okay, we want to improve visibility. We want to be the ones telling the users it, there is a problem with the, with the platform and not the other way around. Uh, so in order to do this, the first step that we took was to create an infrastructure dashboard and now we in encourage our users for, to make that the, that one, the, the first step in, in troubleshooting an issue. You see something is wrong with your service, check the infrastructure. If everything is green, then go and troubleshoot your application. If not, then go into details. Um, even from the early stages of, uh, of the V3 of the platform, uh, we, were, um, we were very careful to, to publish RFOs and we were verbose about the problems that we encountered. Um, this gave confidence to our users that, yes, although the platform might be in an inf in infancy, it has some, some problems, they, we are aware of those problems. They can also track the progress that we do in fixing them. And again, it, it gave a lot of, um, a lot of um, confidence. Uh, now that we have, we had nice monitoring and dashboards and so on, the next step that we took was to give to the users the possibility to subscribe to service alerts. And again, the um, critical component here is to have them relevant. So in our case, we, we made it possible for them to subscribe to alerts. So if a cluster is affected, you should receive an alert only if your application is running in that cluster. If you're in a different uh, availability zone in the same region, you do not care of what happens there. Also, if only one of the components in that cluster is affected and that one is a dependency for you, then yes, you should receive an alert. Um, okay. Uh, I think we have a few minutes, so I'll, I'll drop this in as well. One of the another things that we did different between the V2 and V in V3 was to um, 
was to train our users. In V2, we, uh, we, were, we wanted to keep the entry barrier very low, so what we did was to design tools that would allow them to use our platform just like they would use the rest of the bare metal infrastructure at Booking. So this way, whenever somebody joins Booking, they receive the generic training that tells them, this is how you do deployment, this is how you check for canary errors, and so on. So we wanted to, for them to be able to use the same skills. Uh, however, you, you, end up losing a, uh, you end up fighting a losing battle. Uh, you have to re-implement all the progress, all the new things that a huge com community outside of the company is, is building because they are improving Kubernetes day by day. Uh, and you, you do not have enough resources to, to duplicate that with your own customized tools. So now with, with the third version, we took a, different, a bit of a different approach. We are actually asking our users to know Kubernetes. We expect them to be of, uh, aware of what are the pod statuses, to be able to troubleshoot uh, a pod not starting because of uh, an init container failing, and so on. So in order to do this, we, uh, we've set up uh, an internal training that teaches them Kubernetes, takes them from zero, and it uses like 80% of the time to, uh, it's, it's a Kubernetes 101 to tell them about pods and objects and so on. And then the remaining 20% of the training is booking specific. So we, we have very good, very good feedback about this training. There is a, quite a long waiting list. Uh, so but the, the, the positive part is that although it takes them maybe some, while, some time to get on the training, there are a, all the resources that are out there about vanilla Kubernetes, they apply. So they can learn by themselves. And for the remaining 20% of the, of the time uh, the, of that training, that is booking specific, we wrote extensive docs with examples that they can just copy paste and it takes them from creating a service, requesting dependencies and so on, and all the way to develop, deploying it in a staging and all the way to production. So it is really, um, it is the self self service that we, we gave to the users, and it, it went really it, it worked really really well. Okay, uh, that's all. Just a quick recap. Uh, what we did was to improve replicability. We moved the control plane to bare metal, and we're running it with Puppet and um, SystemD. We reduced the Q, the, the feature set. Most importantly, we removed Kube proxy from the nodes, and that allowed us to make the pause directly addressable, and it opened the 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 the, uh, the gate for using the rest of the of the code that we had available for bare metal, uh, we improved the observability probes, RFOs, and alerts. All of them have to be relevant for the user, so they you don't create fatigue. And the last one is not very technical, but more on soft skill. Self learning worked worked really well for us. Um, let the users learn learn by themselves. That's it. Uh, you can find the slides of that QR uh, and. Uh, if you have any questions, now is the time. Thank you. There is one question. Kubernetes? Uh, the cluster upgrades, because we're applying them, we're applying them with Puppet. So as I mentioned, we have several clusters. Uh, we can apply those uh, upgrades on, on a test cluster, and then you're sure that uh, the, you are using the same tools to apply the, the changes. Um, we, we didn't experience any issues with do doing the rolling upgrades, uh, but you're applying them in the same way as you apply, you change the version of using, of using a library in production. Uh, you, you have a rollout process, we do have a rollout process for rolling out changes in a staged environment, for even with Puppet, um, and it's, it's, it's applied in the same, in the same way. Take a, a chunk of servers, apply the change to them, wait for a while, and then deploy to the rest of the infrastructure. Using, this is exactly what we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to, to have the certainty that we, uh, we can roll back and we, we are in control of the, of the deployment, we're in control of the, the way we, we run the services. And we were used to doing that with systemd, Puppet, and so on, on vast, you know, like we, are, we have tens of thousands of servers, so we are, we were confident we know how to do those things. When we put the, the control plane on, on, on bare metal, we gained that trust that we can, we can do it in the same way. Yes? Origin, we were using, uh, okay, sorry. So the question was if we're using uh, OpenShift or OpenShift Origin, we're using the community edition, the Origin one. 
Um, we went, we were, so this was, uh, we started in 2000, late 2015 with Marathon. In 2016, we, we started with OpenShift. So back then, they, I think they, sh they changed from the um, uh, 3 dot something 5 to 1 dot 6 or the other way around uh, versioning um, scheme. I, so it, it was around dot 6, let's, let me call it like that. I guess that's all. Thank you very much.